Good morning, everyone. Welcome to BCPC's Sunday worship service. We praise God for this time that we can come together and just to worship Him and to, to listen to His Word. So shall we begin with a word of prayer? Heavenly Father, we praise You and thank You and that You have proven Your love to us through Your Son, Jesus Christ. Father, we thank You for salvation, for redemption, for deliverance, and that we can come to You. We do not, we do not need to fear the world. We do not need to fear what the enemy can do to us. And so we surrender to You, O God. We pray that You will cleanse us from all our sins and remove every distraction as we worship You this morning. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Fills the night, it cannot 
his cup and meant his blood. So pour me in the whelming flood. When all around my soul gives way, he then is all my hope and stay. On Christ the solid rock I stand, all other ground is sinking sand. All other ground is sinking sand. When he shall come with trumpet sound, oh may I then in him be found. Trust in his righteousness alone, faultless to stand before the throne. On Christ the solid rock I stand, all other ground is sinking sand, all other ground is sinking sand. sinking sand, all other ground is sinking sand. gift of grace is Jesus my Redeemer. There is no more for heaven now to give. He is my joy, my righteousness and freedom, my steadfast love, my deep and boundless peace. To this I is dark, but I am not forsaken, for by my side the Savior He will stay. I labor on in weakness and rejoicing, for in my need His power is displayed. To this I hold my shepherd
fortress, you go before us. Nothing can stand against the power of our God. You shine in the shadows, you win every battle. Nothing can stand against the power of our God. Almighty fortress, you go before us. Nothing can stand against the power of our God. Shine in the shadows, you win every battle. Nothing can stand against the power of our God. So when I fight, I fight on my knees with my hands lifted high. Oh God, the battle belongs to you. Everything. Sing through the night, oh God, the battle belongs to you. When I fight, I fight on my knees, with my hands lifted high, oh God, the battle belongs to you. Every fear I lay at your feet, I sing through the night, oh God, the battle belongs to you. Greetings, everyone. My name is Harold Gutierrez, and I'm the International and Indigenous Ministers Director with the BCYD. Today, we'll be speaking from 2 Chronicles chapter 20, verses 1 through 7. So I invite you to uh, turn into that passage or look it up in your Bible app. And I'll be reading from the ESV. And it says, After this, the Moabites and Ammonites and with them some of the Meunites came against Jehoshaphat for battle. Some men came and told Jehoshaphat, A great multitude is coming against you from Edom, from beyond the sea. And behold, they are in Hazazor, Tamar, that is in Gedi. Then Jehoshaphat was afraid and set his face to seek the Lord and proclaimed a fast throughout all Judah. And Judah assembled to seek help from the Lord. From all the cities of Judah they came to seek the Lord. Verse 5. And Jehoshaphat stood in the assembly of Judah and Jerusalem in the house of the Lord before the new court and said, O Lord God of our fathers, are you not God in heaven? You rule over all kingdoms of the nations. In your hand are power and might so that none are able to withstand you. Did you not, our God, drive out the inhabitants of this land before your people Israel and give it forever to the descendants of Abraham, your friend? Today, my title is Disrupting the Flow of Fear. It was General Patton, the World War II uh, American general, who in an interview after the war was over said, I learned very early in my life never to take advice from my fears. And Christian friends and brothers and everyone who's tuning in, I'm here to tell you that we all are vulnerable to fear. But fear is a different kind of enemy. Fear doesn't come to be the executioner of your hopes and dreams. Fear comes to advise you for you to execute your hopes and dreams. He seeks, he, fear uses crisis to come into your life to become a counselor and an advice. To go against everything that we are. For as believers, we're all about hope. We're all about victory. We're all about faith. We're all about our trust in our powerful and mighty God. And what fear does in the life of the Christian is that he comes to advise us to go against that hope and that trust in the Lord. If we put our, uh, in the shoes of this King Jehoshaphat, it's easy to see how uh, uh, deep this crisis was. 
Here is the king of the, of, of the southern kingdom. Lord, he is someone who has trusted in God, has had his flaws, has had his victories. But here he is, hearing the news that a bunch of armies are conspiring, are colluding with each other with one intent in mind, to destroy God's people. You and I will be afraid. And we can see how that fear began to try to become his advisor, but immediately he disrupted the flow of fear because it says that he turned his face to the Lord. And that is what we are to do. We are not to just tune fear out. We're not just to have conversations with those things that create and cause fear in us. We are called and we have the power to disrupt that fear. To disrupt whatever fear tries to advise us to do or not to do. And to rise up as the people of faith that we are called to be. That we have the power to be. Through the prayer of Jehoshaphat, we can find a few principles that we can go over today about disrupting the flow of fear. The first principle I will share with you is remembering what God has done. So fear comes in and tries to advise us that our hope in God is futile. That is something that is uh, pretty much unnecessary, that will not be effective. Fear advises us, painting us a picture of a God that may be sovereign in the good times when the sun is out and the weather is nice, but maybe he's not such a strong and powerful God when there is rain, when there are storms, where there are crises. That is the picture that fear tries to paint to us. Or maybe a God that is all powerful and all all knowing, but because you are in the middle of the crisis that you're facing, it means that this God maybe forgot about you. That he's not as concerned as you thought he will be. Those are lies. It's wrong. And we can see how Jehoshaphat, from the very beginning, the first thing he does is that he recognizes God's sovereignty over the nations. It says says right there that God, aren't you Lord over the nations? Aren't you the one in control of the affairs of the nations? Because even in the midst of war, even in the midst of his personal storm, God was God. Sitting on his throne, watching over Jehoshaphat, watching over his people. In the last few months, we have had to face a a, a situation like we have never faced before. And I believe that in the midst of everything that has happened and unfolded over the world, there is an attitude of fear. It's easy to fear that which we do not know. There is a lot of uncertainty There is a lot of misinformation, and it seems that fear tries to grab a hold of our hearts to paint us a picture that maybe God wasn't so so sovereign after all. That is wrong. For even Psalm 21, 11 says that the Lord sits enthroned during the flood. That means that even though you and I have been taken by surprise by recent events, God was never taken by surprise, and he's never taken by surprise. Even when we face crisis, no matter how big or how small they are, God is never taken by surprise for, by anything that happens in your life. He's sovereign, and the storm that you're facing right now, whatever it is, does not mean that his sovereign is less, is intact. But he also even leaned into God's sentiment over our lives. You know, he doesn't talk about a powerful God over the nations. He talks also, he prays to a God that keeps his promises going all the way back to Abraham. Why is, why, why is this so significant? Because if we remember, if we go back into the Old Testament, God made a covenant with Abraham. It wasn't just an empty promise. It wasn't just a contract. 
It was a covenant that was to stand over generations. And that is the kind of relationship that you and I have with God. It's one where there is a covenant. It's one that is guarded by, by a concept that the Old Testament, in, in, in your Bibles, is, is translated as loving kindness. In its Hebrew root is the word shesed. And it, 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 it entails that it's a love that is tied to a promise, a love that is enduring. In other words, even in the midst of our crisis, God's love for us is unchanged. God's love for, God's care for us is untainted. He still loves you. He still cares for you. He is still involved. And in the middle of the crisis, he is active. He's not just sitting on the throne, giving his back towards us, ignoring our needs. No, he knows what hurts us. He knows what makes us afraid. He knows every jot and tittle of what we're facing, and he is deeply concerned. He's powerful, but he's faithful as well. If we lean into that, if every time fear tries to advise us, we cut off the voice of fear, reassuring ourselves and reassuring our soul that God is still active and concerned about us, we will get an upper hand in our battle with fear. Number two, we retain what God says. For Jehoshaphat not only prayed himself, He prayed and called the people to pray with him, to fast, to seek the Lord. It was their first reaction. They stayed there. They leaned into seeking God in their hour of crisis. Is that what we instinctively do when we face crisis? When we hear unpleasant news, when we face uh, things that we didn't see coming, they did that. Even as they were afraid, even as they recognized their fear, they sought the Lord. And when we seek the Lord, we put ourselves in a two-way highway, in a two-way street where we speak, where we share our concerns with God, that God also speaks in the middle of our crisis. If we scroll down that same chapter on verse 15, there is the answer that God gave this king and the people on that day. He pretty much told them, do not be, do not be afraid or do not be dismayed at this great horde or at this great multitude, for the battle is not yours but God's. Now, this wasn't just some kind of um, pep talk to get you up, to to make you feel all, all, all peppy, to ignore the gravity of the situation. This was a statement for all generations. You see, fear tries to advise us that when we're facing a battle, God, some way, somehow, is second. Is subservient to that battle. He's somewhere out there trying to figure it out how to solve the problem. The battle over God. But God reminds us in his word through this passage, through this verse, that when we're facing a battle, God is no below the battle. God actually is in control of that battle. It says that the strategies, the results, the way out of the battle, the way to triumph, The way to victory does not have to rely on us. It relies on a God that is powerful, that is good, and most importantly, that it is for you and for me. Peter will say, where is God in all of this? And God will say, I am in the midst of the battle. He is the general that leads us. That crisis That personal battle that you're facing against that unsurmountable mountain, whether it's financially, whether it's in your family, whatever the magnitude of the battle is, know that God is actually leading the way, leading you into victory, sometimes through the battlefield. Sometimes he actually takes us out of the battlefield, but sometimes he says, you know what, I will lead you through the battlefield, but the most important thing and the thing that we cannot forget and that fear tries to make us forget is that if he chooses to take us through the battlefield, he's actually leading the way in front of us. 
He's not cowering away behind some kind of stone. He's not uh, just going hand in hand with trepidation. He's leading the way. And we see that because there was a commandment. You see, the people weren't told, the battle is not yours, it's God, now everyone go home. No, it actually said, because the battle is not yours, this is what you're going to do tomorrow. You're actually going to go out to the battlefield. You're going to dress yourself, prepare yourself as if though you're going to actually fight this war. But you're just going to go out there and you're going to see how I will deliver you. This brings me to the third principle. Uh, We respond with faith according to what God has promised. We respond. We go out there. But all of this, the key in all of this, is that if we disrupt fear internally, if we disrupt fear at the point where it tries to advise uh, uh, our soul of giving up of any hope of victory, if we're faithful with that, if we're disciplined with that, it will change the way we respond externally to the battle. Because that day, Israel went out, but they didn't go out thinking, this is it. This is our last battle. They're going to annihilate us. We have no hope. They actually went out the next day worshiping, praying, ready to see that God was going to deliver them. And in these times particularly, I believe that so much is being written about How do we properly respond? And I know that maybe the answer to that is is not a simple answer. But if right now, particularly, you're feeling a lot of uncertainty, a lot of fear of what this new normal is going to cause and how it's going to affect your life, or maybe you're beginning to reap the effects of that, I tell you today, you and I are to respond by disrupting fear. We are to respond by disrupting fear so those around us in our household can see that we're examples of faith. As churches, as believers in our communities, we are to actively respond to this calamity with so much faith and hope so our communities around us can see, wow, these are people that have hope. These are people that are in the third, in the midst of unsurmountable odds. I want some of that. And as a matter of fact, fear, to close, operates like a snare, a trap that is meant to suffocate our hopes and our dreams. And in Psalm 124, I invite you to read that on your own. Um, it, it's one of these songs of ascent. The songs of ascents were, were to be sung, were to be celebrations of the people as they will go up to the temple in Jerusalem for the feast and to worship the Lord. And in Psalm 124, it's a declaration of victory that concludes with this statement saying that he had taken us from the snare of the fowler. In other words, if we picture fear as as the weapon's enemy to grip, to suffocate every hope and every every dream that we have, every aspiration of the future, every sense of victory in this life, fear brings to suffocate that. But if we disrupt it, if we face it in a position of power, then that snare is ineffective. That snare gets broken, and it gets broken because our God gets involved in our crisis. I don't know where you are today. I don't know what you're facing, but I tell you this. If you remember what God has done, what God has done in your life up to this point, if you lean into that, it's like leaning into a library of God's acts in your life, that actually changes your perspective. That actually immediately disrupts fear. If you retain what he's saying to you, especially in this time where maybe you might have a little bit more time in your hand and you are concerned, don't give in to those thoughts. Get into the word. For God speaks in the written word. 
For God speaks through prayer. For God reminds us of his promise. God reminds us of what he has said for us. You lean into that. You retain what he says. And if you respond with faith at whatever crisis you're facing, you will see the victory. You will see how God miraculously will do impossibles for you. So I invite you now to pray. Maybe you have been afraid. Maybe you have doubted God's sovereignty and care for you. Today I ask you, let's, let's, let's come back into an attitude of surrender. And let us place in the hands of our sovereign and strong God that which is causing so much fear in your life. I invite you to do that now. And I will pray for you. Father, I pray for the person that is afraid, for the person that is terrified, for the person that has doubted lately your sovereignty and your power, Lord, even your existence. Because that's what fear does. He advises, but he advises us wrongly to veer away from the path of faith. I pray that as we... Uh, as we proclaim, as we come to you, you will take that burden of fear. You will take those battles, the crisis, and you will remind everyone here in this message, you will remind all of us that you are in control of our present, that you are leading ahead of us, O oh Lord, and you will give us victory. And sometimes it might take longer than expected. Nevertheless, if you're leading the way, I believe in the promise. No weapon formed against me shall prosper. Let that be so in the lives of all my brothers and sisters. No weapon, no snare that is trying to kill the dreams and the hope of your people. Prosper against them. Let them rise in faith, O oh God. So that they could be witnesses to their own, into the community that we are. The people of faith. Thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. I want to thank you for join, taking the time to tune into this sermon. And I pray God's riches and mightiest blessings upon you. Thank you.